Well, here we are again, uh, and this is going to be a hopefully brief presentation on the subject of inter-rater reliability. Uh, inter-rater reliability is, of course, a specialized form of reliability. Uh, I'm allowing it its own little presentation because it tends to be a subject that is, uh, shall we say, underplayed by authors of most of your uh, textbooks in the area of assessment, psychometrics, etc. I think that's because most of the authors of those books tend to be people more experienced with what are often referred to as objectively scored tests. Uh, however, as we'll see, inter-rater reliability is extremely important in many walks of life. So, uh, first off, this is one of the ones that has multiple names. Uh, so don't be confused. They, they all mean essentially the same thing. Uh, inter-rater reliability is the most commonly used term and the one I will use most frequently, uh, but inter-judge is used almost as frequently because you know a judge is a rater, a rater is a judge. They're, it, it, for their present purposes, essentially synonymous terms, and I'm gonna go back and forth between them. Uh, we also sometimes see inter-scorer reliability because scores are often being assigned by our judges. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see the prefix between instead of the prefix inter, et cetera, et cetera. Just, you know, all the same thing. So when is this one relevant? Remember that there's no form of reliability that applies to every test in the world. Uh, inter-rater reliability is relevant to the degree that we must exercise judgment in order to make our ratings, to assign scores or um, whatever we're uh, doing in terms of rating here. Uh, that's a matter of degree, of course, but let me give you some examples. Uh, it's relevant when your professor grades a term paper or an essay exam, one of those blue book essays that some people still give, uh, or your class presentation. It's relevant when you assign a clinical diagnosis to a patient. It's relevant when, as a research psychologist, say, or perhaps a clinician, you are trying to identify expressions of motives or personality traits or interests in people's stories, their memories they tell you from childhood, the dreams they recount from last night. It's relevant when, again, as a clinician or researcher, you're looking to identify defense mechanisms that people are deploying in stressful points in an interview, or the degree to which they, their thinking is disordered in characteristically, say, schizophrenic or manic ways. It's relevant when you're evaluating a business proposal or a grant proposal. So, you know, there has been this television program, Shark Tank, and people come with their business ideas, and, you know, the so-called sharks, the potential investors, are evaluating these. Great deal of judgment involved there. Uh, well, which of our creative works are going to be accepted? Will my paintings be displayed at the art gallery? Will my scientific paper be published in a reputable journal? You know, will, will my poetry appear somewhere? You know, all sorts of creative works. Uh, undergo a process of being judged by presumed experts, editors, curators, and so forth before they maybe are accepted. Who's going to get the promotion? You know, who's who's going to make it to full bird kernel? Who's going to become a partner in the law firm out of all of the seventh year associates? Who's going to make tenure among the uh, assistant professors that we've hired five or six years ago? Uh, and finally, you know, last example I'll give you would be appraisals. Uh, how much, what's the value of this sculpture, this piece of statuary? Uh, what's the value of this house and land situated where it is, you know, in say a New England city? Uh, well, that's an awful lot of situations. Uh, now, of course, where it isn't relevant is also going to be a lot of situations all of your multiple choice tests, all of your short answer tests where there's a single correct answer, self-report, personality inventories, attitude surveys, and so forth and so on. You know, if your answers are gonna be yes, no, true, false, A, B, C, or D, on a scale of one to five, where do you dot, 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 uh, any degree of subjectivity is from the person reporting their views, but the scoring is entirely objective. Ah, I slipped into the word objectivity there, didn't I? You know, with what we're looking at, 
things like grades on papers, ratings of business proposals by bank loan officers, you know, whether your paper is accepted by a reputable journal, it's very easy to raise the question, wasn't that just subjective? You know, doesn't everybody have their own opinion? Uh, and the answer here has to be nuanced. To begin with, the question is a bad question. It's a simply put a wrong question. Uh, objectivity versus subjectivity isn't an either or thing. It's a relative thing. There is no judgment made by any human that is entirely objective. There's always going to be some degree of randomness that creeps in and some degree of personal idiosyncrasy. But by the same token, I would say that no judgment, or at least very few judgments, are going to be entirely subjective. There is something that we are trying to tap into when we evaluate how good is that poem, how promising is that business proposal, you know, how likely is it that this person in fact suffers from schizophrenia. There's something that we're trying to get at together. And to the degree that independent observers agree, their observations are objective. Uh, this applies whether it's a simple perceptual observation, which is a very you know, kind of instantaneous judgment, or whether it's a judgment arrived at after you know, a great deal of consideration of a whole variety of evidence. Uh, the only key word in here, by the way, is independent. Uh, when judges collude with one another, discuss with one another, uh, they can arrive at an agreement, and that may not be a bad way to approach certain tasks, but the agreement they're arriving at is in no sense evidence of objectivity or of reliability. Uh, so I've kind of given it away, right? Inter-rater reliability to a simple-minded scientific sort is the quantification of objectivity. They're essentially the same thing. All right, now there is a distinction. This is now getting into more the nitty gritty, right? That was the great, you know, aha philosophical moment that's over. Uh, there's an important distinction here between uh, two different types of ratings or judgments. Uh, first, we have so-called categorical judgments in which the possible ratings are qualitatively different. Uh, you know, strictly speaking, we're on a nominal scale here. And that's things like, you know, are you a boy or a girl? Uh, is this a case of schizophrenia or a case of mood disorder? You know, all, all these sorts of things. You know, what language are you speaking? Uh, those are all qualitative judgments. And then on the other hand, there are so-called dimensional judgments where we're basically on like an interval or ratio scale. Uh, we're talking about quantitative differences now rather than qualitative. So we're saying things like, hmm, What's your IQ? You know, where, where do you stand on a scale of something that we think is related to intelligence? Uh, hey, how hot's your body? Or even on the one to 10 scale, where am I on the hotness scale? Don't answer that. Uh, but these are, again, dimensional ratings where we're assigning something, you know, that's really a score to what we are observing. Uh, this matters because the statistics are different. Uh, so there's a whole, one whole set of approaches we take to establish the reliability of categorical judgments and a very different set we apply to dimensional judgments. Uh, I'm going to touch on what those approaches are, but this particular presentation is not going to delve into how we get the statistics. That's for another day. So categorical judgments. Uh, well, okay. Uh, you start with how much do the judges agree? basically. You know, so you have 80 cases and they agree in 60 out of 80. 60 over 80 is about 0.75. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not good enough, but it's a start. We can say, all right, 75% agreement. Uh, then where do we go from there? Well, we add an adjustment because we have to think about what would have happened if they were just guessing. Because the fact is, especially if there are only two or three options on the table, you know, it's either schizophrenia or mood disorder, you know, or maybe an anxiety reaction, uh, sometimes we're going to agree just by chance. And agreeing by chance isn't evidence of anything, right? Uh, so we, there's a little adjustment we make as a statistic. The most frequently used one at any rate is Cohen's kappa. Uh, there, are, uh, there are alternatives, but this is the one you see all the time. And so kappa re basically represents how much better we're doing than if we were just guessing. 
you know, so you know, if I would have gotten 50% agreement just by guessing, and I've achieved 75% agreement, I've improved on what guesswork would have done by about 50%. You know, I'm halfway from guesswork to perfection. Uh, so again, we're not going to go into how you calculate this today, but that's the gist of it. Dimensional judgments, uh, you actually have a couple of major approaches out there. Um, but in general, these, for people who work a lot with tests and measures, these are more familiar. You know, we, we're dealing with numbers, right? And so the numbers that we get to establish reliability are going to be reliability coefficients, very similar to the ones that we derive when we're calculating, say, internal consistency. Uh, there are two main methods out there for this. Uh, one is the so-called Spearman-Brown prophecy formula that's been around forever. Uh, it's, you know, basically a more general form of the famous split half procedure. Uh, if you are ever doing this by hand, this one's pretty easy to manage by hand. If you have the correlations across the judges, you just plug in a very simple formula and you're, do you're done. Uh, the other approach is the so-called intra-class correlation coefficient or ICC, uh, which is maybe a little bit better in some ways, uh, although generally the results come out real similar. You know, ICC tends to be a little more conservative, you know, so maybe your Spearman-Brown approach gave you a reliability of, you know, 0.82, and the ICC gives you 0.795, you know, and you're like, okay, which one do I pick? Frankly, either one, uh, but I would say if you have to do some of the, this by hand, Spearman-Brown is easier to do, uh, whereas if you're operating in a statistics program like SPSS, there's a pretty good chance that ICC is built right into it. So, Let's look quickly at the Spearman-Brown approach. Uh, as I mentioned, you need the correlations across the judges. Uh, so you know if that's already available, or if you can crunch it out either by hand, that's kind of painful. But you know, a spreadsheet will even do that for you. Uh, you take the average, and you now have the reliability of one judge. So if you're only going to have one person looking at each test protocol the average correlation across your judges is your best estimate of how reliable those ratings are. So sometimes that's what you wanna go with. Uh, other times you're gonna have a number of judges look at something, two, three, four, 20, however many, uh, and you could use the Spear and Brown formula to adjust upward from the mean average correlation up to the, cor up to the reliability of the averaged out ratings across all the judges you have. Always a higher number, of course. Now, you know, how do we make it better? Let's just say our reliability isn't looking as good as we want it to. Uh, this can happen uh, quite easily on your research project or in your actual you know, work running a grant awarding agency or a tenure committee or admissions committee or something like that. Well, remember, there are only two ways to improve reliability, right? Just two. You take more measurements and then the random errors start to cancel themselves out or you take better measurements. You try to squeeze some of that randomness out of the individual measurements. That's always the only two ways you have, and they apply to inter-rater reliability just as surely as they do to everything else. So let's look at approach number one. Uh, simple thing here is that you're going to increase the number of raters, the number of judges. Uh, so remember, each judge is taking one measurement. I assigned a rating of, you know, 74, whatever, on, on some scale to a product. Uh, and if we assume that our judges correlate at a certain level, whatever that level might be, then uh, adding judges is going to increase the reliability of their pooled or averaged ratings. Uh, in other words, your raters here are basically operating in a manner analogous to the items on a test. You know, if you go from 10 items to 20 items on a test, it tends to get more reliable. If you go from four judges to eight judges, their average judgments will tend to get more reliable. The reason for this is that as with items on a test, each judge has some unique quirks and some randomness, but also shares something with the other judges. And that's the essence of what we're trying to get at. So when we average out what four different judges have said, their individual quirks get minimized. You know, supposing we were rating bands, for example, I'll use a more extended example in a minute. Suppose we're rating bands. 
what if we have individual preferences for musical styles or for types of instrument? Our ratings of the musicianship of the people in the band will be affected by that. Uh, so if you have just one judge, that judgment could be skewed towards a specific genre. Uh, if you have two judges, they hopefully won't have exactly the same preferences. If you have eight judges, you see what's happening. You know, you have a greater diversity of uh, quirkiness, but the individual quirks are now only weighing in for one eighth, you know, of the possible points rather than all of them. Uh, so let me use an example. Uh, let's say we're running a film production company. Sounds like fun. And of course you have a lot at stake here because whenever you produce a movie, it's a big investment. So new screenplays are coming in all the time and you gotta have your readers looking at them, right? So here, that's their job is to evaluate these screenplays, these scripts, these proposed film projects. And only the ones that obtain a high enough score are going to come to the attention of the actual producers who might actually fund it. Now, you know, you have some nerdy psychologist on staff somewhere, you know, maybe your kid goes to college at my, where, where I'm teaching this course, and you know you find that their ratings actually correlated only 0.3. Uh, so they correlate positively, but the, the separate judges are really giving very, very different judgments in many cases. So how reliable are the ratings? And you know, I hope you all recognize this, there'd be a lot at stake here. You know, we, we could be investing tens of millions of dollars in each movie. We don't have bottomless pockets. Uh, so if we're basically selecting screenplays almost at random, that's not a good thing. Uh, well, if I have only two raters, the this, by the way, I plugged the numbers in here. That's, so don't worry about where they come from, but they are accurate. Uh, if I have two raters, the correlation, the correlation of 0.3 would yield an effective reliability of only 0.46. More than half of what we're getting is still random noise. With three raters, we're up to 0.56. Still not great, but moving in the right direction. Four, I'm up to 0.63. I'm starting to feel a little better about this. Uh, go up to eight. Our reliability is now up to 0.77. I'm kind of beginning to like that. If I can get to 12, I'm all the way up to 0.84, which is a pretty comfortably high level of reliability. The trouble is I have to have eight or even 12 people read each screenplay. So there's also the other approach. How do I get the judges to agree more closely? Raise the correlation across the judges, across the raters. Uh, and this is especially important in a scenario like the one I'm just presenting where you're probably gonna have the same readers, you know viewing products possibly for years on end. Uh, although it can be important, you know, even in your own thesis or dissertation project, you don't want to have the need to recruit like 10 judges. You know, that, that's, that's hard to find. Uh, so, you know, there are strategies for this. Uh, one approach is to train them you know, have a kind of training program uh, and the training would include examples. So, you know, here are examples of, you know, if, if it was paintings, you know, these are, these are well executed paintings. These are not so well executed. Uh, so you're kind of trying to get them more calibrated through a period of time when they're actually collaborating, working together and reaching a general agreement about the nature of what they're looking for before they go off and start doing things independently. And of course you're providing supervision. Uh, a second approach is to develop, uh, you know, basic algorithms, which in, in education speak are often called rubrics, uh, that they're going to follow. So there are definable aspects of the product that are rewarded up to a certain number of points, and you're shown, you know, kind of anchor points of here's how many points it should get if they meet this level, here's how many points it should meet if it meets that level, and so forth. So they're all filling in their little rubrics. They tend to agree more closely. Uh, a third option, of course, is if you have raters who just don't get it, they're not correlating with everybody else, uh, you could eliminate them, drop them out of the pool. You know, they don't count anymore. Be careful about that one, though, because you know, if you have, say, four judges you're working with, one who doesn't correlate with the others may well be doing a relatively poor job. They just don't understand what you're looking for. But they also might be someone who has an equally valid 
but different perspective than the other three. You know, you have three who all have very similar backgrounds and they tend to perceive things the same way. Uh, so they all share the same like bias or kink or quirk, uh, whereas the other one has a different bias, kink or quirk, which actually would help to correct it. In practice, this is real hard to figure out. Uh, I think often in practice, people will simply eliminate the judges who don't correlate with the rest and either not think about this issue or just hope for the best, but it is, it is an issue. So back to our screenplay example, uh, we develop a training program again, the chief, you know, the executive producer's nerdy son gets to work on this and uh, they develops a rubric and trains all the readers, all the folks who want to work for the studio as screenplay readers uh, over a five-day session. They read sample scripts, they evaluate them and are given, you know, the, the right answers, the ones that the you know, top people had arrived at. Uh, and the rubric, let's just say, includes five elements, and the manual is going to define these, but we don't want to go into all that. So there's one that's basically how competently is it presented in a, from a strictly mechanical point of view. Is this like screenplay written by someone who knows how to write screenplays? One is the storytelling craft, the structure of the story, the dramatic arc of the story. One is the depth of characterization. Are we interested by the people in it? One is the degree to which there's a personal voice present, uh, you know, an underlying theme or, or guiding idea. And finally, there's the question of whether this is budgetarily manageable. So maybe you can get up to 10 points for each of those, up to 50 in all, you see. And so because they're following this step-by-step -step procedure, the judges will tend to agree more closely. So what if we get them up to an average correlation of 0.5? Well, this increases the reliability of their joint ratings as well. So for two raters, we're already up to 0.67, three raters 0.75 and so forth. And if you compare this to what was on the previous slide, a few slides back, uh, you'll find that we're with about half as many raters as before, we're achieving comparable levels of reliability. So that one week training program means that maybe we can get by with only three or four people reading each screenplay rather than you know, eight or so people reading each one. Um, so to sum up, uh, inter-rater reliability is extremely important in many research and real life situations. Not that research isn't real life, but you know what I mean. Uh, whenever, we're relying on human perception. Whenever we're relying on human judgment or evaluation, inter-rater reliability rears its head. It is a factor. The more judgment is required, the more important it is to examine and try to maximize inter-rater reliability. Uh, the statistics we're using are basically estimates of objectivity. Uh, and again, we have two different approaches. So if it's we're making a qualitative judgment, like what's your diagnosis, we start with percentage agreement, then make a little adjustment to correct for chance, which lowers things a bit, unfortunately. Uh, when we're working with scores on some kind of a you know, rate dimensional rating scale, we use correlation-based methods, which are essentially similar to those we use for calculating internal consistency, but have different names. Uh, and as always, there are two ways of making reliability go up. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the judges or raters. One approach is to have more of them. The other is to train them more adequately uh, and increase their level of agreement. With that said, uh, we are in fact 